Right. Um, I like to start with a little exercise. You'll be surprised. Haha, <laughs> coming from me, eh? I'm going to take my shoes off to be comfortable. So you can see my shortness rather than my highness. <laughs> okay. There is a, a very simple exercise that you do when you have to project your voice. And so I'm afraid you have to stand up again. You are home, you don't have to, but um, there is something about your posture. You have your legs slightly apart, not like that. You need to be really relaxed, shoulder relaxed, okay? And then you do to, as long as you can carry it, but it has to come from your tummy, so you have to be relaxed. And you go, shh. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it's not, it's not a price for the one that lasts longer. <laughs> it, it's uh, it's uh, an exercise to help you to relax and sing from your tummy, <laughs> from the diaphragm. And it's a, it's, you don't expect from me a talk, uh, a very articulate talk. It's just I want to talk about what the Lord has put in my heart for a while. And one of the pictures he gave me was of somebody very relaxed, just speaking into, speaking the word into reality. Because Jesus is the word. Now you can sit down. Yeah. I'm not expecting you to all stop. Um, people in community know, and some people particularly laugh at me because I'm often talking about my own death. And, uh, and it's a phrase, it's a funny turn of phrase that during a conference, I just said, well, I don't have that. What have we got to live? I don't have much longer to live. And they, li they laugh at it. I haven't got much left. Much, I haven't got much left to live. And, and you know, in Christian circle, when you say such thing, there is a sense, oh my goodness. No, you're victorious. Yeah. And yeah, you are victorious, but you are bound to die too. And, and I'm going to start by that's, that scripture values death, not has something horrible like we have in the world, but as a promise of something better. And death is something that should help us not to live our lived life, but should help us to imagine our future in heaven. Because otherwise, our life, joys, pain, success, they wouldn't make much sense if we didn't believe in eternal life. So this is not what I'm saying, okay? It's scripture, just to <clears throat> boast and to give a bit of humph to what I'm going to say. One of my favorite psalm is Psalm number 90. And it's a beautiful psalm, and, the, and I'm going to read just a little bit because it's beautiful and speaks for itself. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that had just gone by, or like a watch in the night. I used to argue with God about this psalm, and I used to say, it's all very nice for you to say the thousand year is like just a, a watch in the night. I'm not going to be here for those years. 
yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning is spring up new, but by the evening is dry and withered. You are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You are set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Moan? Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. For the quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Teach us, <coughs> this is the bit that always stays with me. Teach us the number of our days that we may gain a wisdom of heart. Now it sounds all very doom and gloomy, but actually it's good news because knowing your mortality, you have the opportunity to spend your life in the fullness of, of life that the Lord has gained for us. And do you know how? How did he gain it for us? Anybody? How did he gain it for us? Death. Through, through death. So why are we so afraid to talk about death? Do you want the answer? Yes. He died and rose again. Yes, but death, death is what we need to talk about because dying to self is part of the deal, Joe. It's good to talk about resurrection, but where is death in all of that? Where is the dying to myself, to what is my sinful nature? Not dying to him, not dying to the heavenlies. This is why it can be controversial, okay, what I'm about to say. But Jesus said in John 12, unless the seed dies in the ground, it cannot bear life. So that's the death I'm talking about. And if we are not able to talk about death and accompany people who are dying with that heart, then what are we doing here, brothers and sisters? I'm not being preacher-like, it's actually on my heart. If I don't believe in heaven, you tell me, why am I wasting time here? Might as well enjoy myself <laughs> like they do in the world on Friday night. Go boozing, you know I like a drink. <laughs> you know? Why am I here? Why are we here tonight? It's because we want to catch a glimpse of eternity. The word that the Lord gave me, and it was quite funny, was, you know, when you say that the Lord that gave me a word, even that, the Lord spoke to me of speaking, imagining that in this room there are no Christians. <laughs> And if I said to my dear friend, I'm not going to name the friend I'm talking about, but if I say to my lovely friend, the Lord spoke to me, he's going to look at me saying, she's funny in her head. What's she saying? So if you weren't Christian, I would say to you, I had this gut feeling in my spirit or in my heart. Procrastination. Do you know the word procrastination? Are you a procrastinator? Yes, right, me too. Who else is a procrastinator here? Anybody? Yeah, Pedro, thank you so much. <laughs> it makes me feel better. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm just delivering them to respond. <laughs> <laughs> no, I laughed even at tonight. I thought that was funny. A little Sim technical. Sim is a procrastinator, <laughs> right? Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you some of the things that are reflecting on why and where are the areas where I am a procrastinator. Because I tell you, in my family life, I'm very organized. Aren't I, Manny? Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very organized, my house is clean, my family is fed, and you know, everything is tickety boo. <laughs> but there are, thank you, my husband agrees over there, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. But there are some areas 
that I am a procrastinator. When I was a child, I used to be a procrastinator when it came to school. I hated school. I hated, with, it was a visual hate, hatred. So I would leave it to the last minute. So what do we procrastinate on? One of the things is that we don't, the, we procrastinate because we don't like something. Or we procrastinate, I, I'm gonna say I, so I don't wanna generalize. Gaetana trimming procrastinates when she's afraid. If you ask me of something really painful that I need to do, I would rather put it off because my heart, my whole person would rather do anything else. For example, confrontation. I hate it. So I would rather put it off and put it off. Or when the Lord speaks to me about areas of my life that need changing, I would put it off and I say, yeah, okay, Lord, tomorrow morning. It's like the people who have, who smoke and will say, I'll have the last fag and that's it. I know what I'm talking about, okay? Because I know my vices too. So, procrastination. I'm going to tell you one thing that I found out. It's not me. It's actually Martin Luther King says, when there is a hill to climb, don't think that waiting will make it smaller. This is just to make you smile a little bit. Another gem I found, saying Google, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. So when we talk about community, when we talk about church, when we talk about our life, what are the area that make her freak out, that, that we don't wanna to die to? That's, what, that's the death. I'm not entitled to talk about palliative care. I just want to reassure you, I wasn't talking about that form of death. Although in my life, I've seen quite a few people dying. And, and lately, as you know, I have accompanied, I've had the privilege to accompany somebody die, and it was a great privilege to see the journey, but I'm not here to talk about that. I want to say one more thing, and I, <coughs> that is not scriptural, but I found really beautiful. And again, is, Martin Luther King. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. It's not tomorrow that we evangelize, it's today. It's not tomorrow that we change if the Lord is telling us. It's now. There is an urgency. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked and dejected with a lost opportunity. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous of civilization, I've written, written the pathetic word, too late. Now let us begin. Now let us <coughs> dictate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. And that's the urgency I'm talking about. That's the death, in a sense, that I'm talking about. It's the, the hope of change. It's the sense that if the Lord is asking us to do something now, and we procrastinate because we are afraid of what he would mean, 
then we, we are not responding to the fullness of life. We are actually, yet again, we are crucifying Jesus in a sense. Whilst if we live our life trusting that the ones who died for me can bring about in me his resurrection, then my life will be lived in transformation. You know, Jesus never said to people, you know, sometimes when we envisage um, evangelization, we either envisage saying <coughs> nice things so that people are not scared, or just bash them and tell them that un unless they're born again, and they don't even have a clue what it means to be born again. And yet we go there and say, you've got to be born again. And they're thinking, what, what? And, and either do that, or we say, oh, it's all right. Jesus loves you. But Jesus always spoke truth. But he did it with so much love and tenderness. He never judged anybody. So I was imagining myself in the, in the shoes of the woman at the well, when she yet again, out of fear, out of fear, call it procrastination, she tells the people in front of her what she's used to say, despite the fact that she's going to get the water at the well when nobody's around so that she's not seen because she's too ashamed of who she is, then he, she says to him, yeah, I'm going to go and fetch my husband. Then he just says, he doesn't say, your husband isn't there. He says, but you're not married. It's just a fact. He doesn't <laughs> bash her. He just tells her the truth. And, and when I talk about dying, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about the courage to move forward. And as a community, if we don't have the courage to look at the future of community, we, we are not dying. We're not dying in order for, a, for the body of Christ to be resurrected. This is what the Lord has called us to do, to die, to give our life away in order to see the future. And I want to read something that Mother Teresa of Calcutta or St. Mother Teresa, said, I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that pray prayer changes us and we change things. To say sometimes when it's really obvious that the Lord is calling us to speak out, to, sh to merely say, I'm just praying about it. It's a poor excuse. I'm not saying it's always the case because sometimes we like bull in a china shop and we think we are transforming the world. It's not that, it's Jesus. So as long as you remember that you're not bashing, you're breathing out the word of God, then you are, you are meant to speak out. You are meant to say to the dry bones, come alive. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the courage to be changed by prayer. I need to be changed by prayer in order to be the, the, the woman that the Lord has called me to be. And sometimes it's pretty tough because there is nobody in this room who cherished the idea of being disliked. Is there somebody here that really loves to be disliked? Carol, do you really like when people really look at you horribly and they think, there she comes again, oh my goodness. You don't, do you? <laughs> and, and much more if the people, imagine if Sarah, she's your friend, right? And Sarah sees you coming and she says, oh, <laughs> that's painful. <laughs> but you know, that's the reality sometimes. It's the reality. And what do we do? Do we get crumbled by it or do we keep loving? Do we just love those who love us? Do, that's the dying I'm talking about. It's really real. You know, it's really real to have people that you love 
who don't love you because of what you stand for. Um, sorry, I'm getting really passionate about it. I don't mean to, I really don't mean to, this is good news I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. I don't want you to go away or you at home never turn up ever again because you feel that much, I'm bashing you. I'm just saying the Lord has got so much more to give us if we let whatever is not of him die within us in order to live a resurrected life. This week, in the office of reading, in fact, it was all souls. And, you know, I, I tend to believe, regardless of what the denominations you are, I'm very grateful for my tradition, because the all souls is a very special day. In Italy, where I come from, it's very special, all souls and all saints. All saints is just an excuse to dress up and kiss everybody. That's what we do. You know, Italians like to hug and because it's all saints, we go around cemetery, we just kiss each other and say, happy saints day. And on all souls day, we sit by the tomb of our beloved and we just spend the day as if it was a party. It's true, we do that. And on, on All Souls Days, I read this beautiful passage from um, the Office of Reading, and I'm going to read it to you because he had such profound effect on me. So forgive my gadget use. Okay. This is from the Office of Reading. What more need be said? It was by the death of one man that the world was redeemed. Christ did not need to die if he did not want to. But he did not look on death as something to be despised, something to be avoided, and he could have found no better means to save us than by dying. Thus, his death is life for all. We are sealed with the sign of his death. When we pray, we preach his death. When we offer sacrifice, we proclaim his death. His death is victory. His death is a sacred sign. Each year, his death is celebrated with solemnity by the whole world. What more should we say about his death since we use this divine example to prove that it was death alone that won, won freedom from death. And death itself was its own redeemer. Death is then no cause for mourning, for it is the cause of mankind's salvation. Death is not something to be avoided, for the Son of God did not think it beneath his dignity, nor did he seek to escape it. Death was not part of nature, it became part of nature. God did not decree death from the beginning, he prescribed it as a remedy. How about that? <laughs> death as a remedy. So how about the fact that every time I die to myself, I am set free by death itself. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise. Make the most of the opportunity because the days are evil. We know that. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, it's not good enough to say, I'm praying, I trust, God is reason. Yeah, but you have a responsibility to hear. Yeah? What's the, what's the Lord's will for me? Do not get drunk on wine. That's a hard one. <laughs> Which lead to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. 
speaking to one another with psalms and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good news. It's good news to know that we're destined to heaven. It's good news to know that heaven can be lived right now, right in this very moment. Not in a fleshy way, but in a real way, because Jesus is real. So we don't have to just go like this and look holy. I, I, I've heard many stories of people who would um, look and talk a certain way or go to uh, looking very kind of lost and, you know, and then five seconds later, <laughs> they will be on earth again because at the moment of the anointing is passed. The anointing, I'm feeling the anointing. You're always anointed. Your whole life is anointed. Everything that we do, our job is anointed, is blessed. There is no area in our life that has not been gained by the Lord and his death. There is dignity in our human life. There is dignity in dying, whether in the flesh or in the spirit. There is dignity. One of the difficult things when, when you look at situations or, or people is exactly the procrastinating spirit of this world. Because in this world, because things are tough, people will say, well, let's just ignore the problem. So for example, tonight when we were in the chapel, we were praying and Sylvie shared about the fact that people don't care about the planet. And Tom said, yeah, that's right, because you think I'm not going to be here forever, so who cares about plastic in the ocean or, you know, it's fine, I'm not going to be there. That means we're not our brother's keepers. You know, we let people and the situation and the world die. So that's, that's, that's procrastinating. <laughs> And, and people do that in the world because they think as long as they've got food on the table and money in the bank, then they're fine. And they forget that it takes very little. We are, we are mere mortal. And, and we, think, we think we are eternal. We are because the Lord has made us eternal. But in a sense, that can't be the cause of our joy or think that if we have more, we will be happy, then we will be happy. For many, many years, this is very personal to me, and that's why I'm talking like this and I'm very passionate because it's a journey I've gone into. And I, I have gone to, into dying. I have been dying when my father died, when my mother died, there was a lot of me that died with them. But there was a lot that I could foresee coming and it was very painful. And, and for many years as a young person, I used to say, if only I had that much in the bank. I did. If only I didn't have a mortgage. If only my sister shared her inheritance with me. If only, and it was it was it was a wanting more and and putting my joy dependent on that. And the Lord had not taken away that sense of injustice or whatever but he has made me realize how very little I need. So actually, the dying, because it's hard, 
but that dying has made me freer because <laughs> I do I, we don't need a lot in life you know and and I say that we really it's not like the fox that says the grapes are too high if somebody offers me a mortgage pay for I'm really grateful don't get me wrong okay just to clear the air but it was the journey of not believing that I was less happy because I had less does it make sense and for me that meant dying meant dying to everything I know because I come from a wealthy family I come from a family where mortgages is is a word that is not in the vocabulary. So that was dying for me. It might not be dying for people in Africa, don't get me wrong, it's all in balance. But that was my journey. My journey of knowing richness, good clothes. I still got some of the clothes I wore as a young person and when I wear them, people say, wow. And I say, yeah, no, they're Armani. <laughs> I don't do that anymore, but, but I'm being very silly to say the journey of dying and the procrastination bit and the fear that if you don't get what you want, you're not going to be happy. And it's not that. You're not going to be happy if you're not in Christ. Do you remember what the servant do you remember the story of the man and the, you know, he says, I've got enough wheat. I can just be happy now. And, and then that very night his life is called. Do you remember the story of the virgins who are not ready with their lamps because they're procrastinating? They put off keeping the lamp going, keeping the prayer going, keeping your priorities going in the Lord. Now, it sounds all very heavy, but it's not because you don't have to try hard. I like what you say that prayer, we don't have to try hard. In fact, we don't, but we do have to die to that desire of not. It's the desire to begin with. <laughs> the rest is up to the Lord, but we, do we desire truly to follow him wholeheartedly? Do we believe that whether our life is long or short, if we live, we live with him. If we die, we, di we die with him. Do we? It's, it's hard. Are we preparing to die? Are we? And if we are, how are we imagining it? It's a mystery. It's a profound mystery. And it's a mystery that I know there are books written by people who come back to life and all of that. And you can take it or leave it. I'm not here to convince you about that. That's not what I'm on. But what fascinates me when people are dying in the real sense, especially if they are in a coma, is that it's their journey with the Lord. You don't know what's going on, but I am certain I am certain that even after that, even for the people who might die and not be reconciled with the Lord, I am convinced that we can still pray because the mercy of God are not our mercy. His sense of justice is not our justice. So, I, you know, I believe that even from hell we can <coughs> save people. St. Paul says so. Some save them from the fire, he says. So I hope this is good news, everybody at home. I, I hope I, I have and you here. I hope you I haven't put you off. And if I have, hey, I'm sorry. I hope that you don't love me less because of that. <laughs> because that will that will crush me and then I'll have to go on a journey of dying, blah blah blah. You know, I do enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> not really um, I would like to read you one more thing about vision because it's really important because it's vision that help us to die for me the vision of what I can I can pass on 
even in community, at this very moment, in the role that I am, I'm always thinking about who's coming after me. I know I'm not old, but somehow I have a great sense of urgency. And sometimes jokingly, I say to Sylvie, when I die and you have to, you have to talk to Bunny, so you have to, <laughs> you have to tell him that everything is all right. <laughs> but I think of the future. I think in a hundred years, House of the Open Door, who will be here? And who will be here depends very much on how much I'm prepared to die. In the sense of how much I'm prepared to challenge myself to live a holy life. I don't mean it dying and being crushed, okay? That's not what I mean. I'm think I'm I'm talking about living a life according to what the Lord wants and living with no compromise. Jesus didn't make compromises, neither should we. So today is the day of salvation, he says in Corinthians 2, verse 6. And now I have to tell you about vision, not according to the Bible, but according to LinkedIn. <laughs> okay, there is a guy called Simon Sinek, or Sinek, forgive my... Uh, um, yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. There you go. You see, somebody's on LinkedIn. I'm not. But no, I'm not. not LinkedIn. I've heard his You've heard. YouTube. He's yeah. very good. I have to say, as Christians, we've got a lot to learn from worldly um, leaders or pre preparing leaders and whatever. He says, vision, imagine, and I know this has happened in this community. I know it's happening a lot of you. I know it's happened for you, Sarah, for you, Carol. It's happened, you've had vision. So embrace this because he says, vision is the ability to talk about the future with such clarity, it is as if we were talking about the past. How about that? You talk about vision, something has not yet come oh. as if it was here already. And that is the vision of heaven I'm talking about, obviously. I'm making him talking about heaven. He's not talking about heaven, but I'm talking about heaven. Yeah, that the vision of heaven, that he's ahead of us and he's here, he's so present that it seems like we're already there. <laughs> You know, we're already in heaven. We're already in heaven when we, when we pray and therefore we do things. <coughs> I have got a new, new say, you know, Descartes, famous philosopher, he used to say, I think therefore I am. Okay, it's all about him and thinking and all that. That's unfortunately has affected a lot of our um, Western mind. Well, I, I like to say, whether it's theologically correct or not, but it's my new phrase, I think, therefore I pray. <laughs> or I pray, therefore I think. Because the Lord is enlightening our mind, not just our spirit, our mind also, so that we can make changes using our, our minds. So, I think I've said enough, haven't I? Don't want you to. Yeah, I think I have. So the last thoughts, just because I like all these people that I've been mentioning, I mentioned Luther King. I haven't mentioned tonight Mahatma Gandhi, but I like him too. <laughs> and I've mentioned Mother Teresa. And the last one I'm going to say is Mahatma Gandhi. Sounds funny coming from a Christian, but he was a great man of God. And I'm sure we'll find him in heaven. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> Carefully watch your thoughts, for they become your words. 
Manage and watch your words, for they will become your actions. Consider and judge your actions, for they have become your habits. And knowledge and watch your habits, for they shall become your values. Understand and embrace your values, for they become your destiny. And the greater value the greater habit, the greater person in our life is Jesus, is he not? So all I've talked about is really good news. So shall we finish just praising him? Shall we? Shall we breathe out? Shall we let out the praises of him into the darkness tonight? Because there is a lot of darkness, but there is a lot of light. And if you are in the darkness, you appreciate the light even more. So we thank you, Father, that you gave up your only son for us. We give you thanks because you give us the ability through your grace to not be afraid. <coughs> to not put off the calling that you have made us, you made in our own individual lives, in our communities, in our churches, in our villages. You give us the ability not to be procrastinators, but to go and even in trembling and fear, one step up to the other, Lord, you will lead us through. We trust, Lord, that it's enough for today to see the first step. And I want to pray for anybody tonight, whether in our midst or in our hearts, who is still watching that first step. I just want to pray, Lord, that you give courage. Give us courage to make a step forward and to rejoice because one more step has been taken. Lord, help us not to look too far away, but to today. Help our today to influence our tomorrow. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit and change. Change our morning into dancing, Lord. And Lord, we pray for all those who are dying, for all those who have passed before us. I want to pray for the gentleman in the village who died last night. Father, just have him in your arms. Lord, just be his wife, consolation. Lord, may she see heaven. May she experience heaven in her grief. Lord, you said that all our tears will be wiped away. Lord, we offer you the tears of regret. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that it's not too late. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your tender love. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. Keep our hearts in the heavenlies. Keep our feet on the ground and our eyes into heaven. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Guy.